FameLab is now the world's, and to the best of our knowledge, the universe's largest science communication competition. And it all began right here in Cheltenham, or actually probably more over there, uh, almost 10 years ago to this day. So this is now, you're part of something that's become the biggest science communication competition in the world. You should whoop it up for that if for no other reason. Come on, guys, I don't want to be the only one talking here. Right now, so in the last decade, as we've seen FameLab grow, we've seen some fab and funky and thought-provoking, head-exploding science communicators from all corners of the globe, although with a largely European bias for historical reasons. This year, it's going to be different for one key reason. It's going to be even better. I've seen what's going to be in front of us, and you're going to be more impressed than you can believe. I'm going to be here for the next six or so hours. Anybody else planning to be here for all three semi-finals? Yeah, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it, yes. <laughs> That's going to be two Springsteen gigs back to back or an entire series of Game of Thrones minus the advert breaks. So if we all survive it, <laughs> let's form a small support group at the end of it all. So there's one final or semi-final cri critical element to all of this, and I mean critical in more ways than one, and that is our judges. Now, as well as the three-minute solo turn from each fame labber, they also have to survive a brief grilling for a couple of minutes by our judges. And again, there are three. So please give a fame lab full-on semi-final welcome to our chair, biologist, bug botherer, broadcaster, and professor of science communication at the University of Gloucestershire, Adam Hart. And our other judges, our broadcaster, writer, and the last person to interview a beautiful mind mathematician, John Nash, although the police have eliminated her from their inquiries, the vivacious, vivifying Viv Parry. <laughs> and finally, the nearest equivalent we have to a patient zero in terms of spreading fame lab around the world, the director of BC Bulgaria and key figure in the whole history of fame lab, Lubov Kostova. So Adam, as the chair, you looked shocked there. Just for, the be <laughs> just for the benefit of those who are new to all this, or who've forgotten, or, or who vaguely care, what are the criteria you will be trying to judge our fame labbers on? Well, we're going to be judging on content. Obviously, it's got to be scientifically uh, valid and scientifically sound. We're going to be judging on charisma. Inevitably, part of science communication is being charismatic and getting the message out. Um, personally, I'm inevitably, there are exceptions to that rule, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> um, Personally, I'm going to be looking to be immersed. I'm going to be looking to forget that I'm here judging. That's the best form of science communication, one that you're not even thinking about. And I'm definitely looking to learn something. So that's my criteria today. Viv, all the people here, they're all winners already. So they've already won through heats and semi-finals and national finals, so they're all winners. What's going to make the difference between someone who's won at that level and somebody who's going to be turning up on this at Cheltenham tomorrow in the final? Do you know, I always think, it's a bit, uh, as you say, about immersion. I always think if someone leaves you wanting to know more about the subject, you think, God, I really, that's really interesting. I better go and look up a bit more about that. I want to read more about that. So if somebody draws me right in, then they're the person that wins for me. Right, it gives you a sort of warm feeling. Well, they can do that as well. Well, I was just thinking about kind of immersion <laughs> heaters, but fine, okay. But uh, Lubov, 10 years on, this fame lab is bigger than ever. Now, a large part of that is down to you. So why is there no Bulgarian fame labber with us this year? This year we had a, actually there is a Bulgarian in the audience, and they're a, a <laughs> Fame Lab All Stars. That's one of the new innovations we've uh, introduced. We gave a chance to runner ups from previous years to come on stage and demonstrate how great it is to go through Fame Lab and have all the experience of the training and the international um, meetings, and then come back on stage and demonstrate how much better it can be years on. So it is amazing. The quality is really amazing, and I'm sure we'll see the same on stage tonight. And am I right in thinking that the winner of that is actually with us in Cheltenham? I don't know if they're with us today. Is he that is, right? He is. He is here. He is in the audience, and his name is Dimitar, and he's a geography uh, PhD, so you may want to have your geography right. Are you with us, Dimitar Zhelev? <laughs> Are you here? <laughs> well, come on, stand up. <laughs> Yay! Right, round of applause. He's the Hall of Fame Lab winner. Fame Lab All Stars person. <laughs> right. um, it's also good, that's an illustration for the rest of you, that's what a winner looks like, okay? Just focus on that, that could be, that could be useful. Now, one more important thing to mention before we unleashed our first Fame Labber, and that important thing is yourselves. You will also collectively be deciding on one person to go through to the grand final, 
That's what those voting pads are for, although we're having difficulty getting them to work earlier, so we might go back to pen and pencil, but we'll see. So we'll have an audience vote. They'll get a place in the final, whether or not they're one of the people chosen by our judges, okay? I'll get on to the details of how we vote later. Right, so... If we're clear about the competition, we're clear about the rules, we're clear about the judges, we're clear about your role, then are we all clear to begin? Yeah, yeah, excuse, me, excuse me, excuse me, we've got a bit of a we crisis a here. Crisis we're here. a pen crisis. Ah, it's all right. We're okay. Yeah, thank you. We, we have three judges here, all of whom may try and big up their roles. I'm just warning you, do not let them upstage you, fame labbers, as well. Okay? So, the order of all 27 semi-finalists has been randomly determined, but the order they have to turn up on stage is very precise. And we start with our Fame Lab Italy winner, Luca Perry. That's only nine letters, but stick around to semi-final three. We've got one with only six. Uh, a member of Italy's National Institute of Astrophysics and National Institute of Nuclear Physics, as well as a guide at the observatory in Milan. Luca says he is crazy and usually funny. We'll be the judge of that, Luca. And likes to show that science on every scale, from the pangalactic to the subatomic, relates to our everyday lives. But can he show that in just three Fame Lab minutes? Not easy going first, it's harder still finishing first, but Italy do at least have a head start. So applause, please, for our crazy, funny Italian champion, Luca Perry. Hi, I'm a cosmic detective. The universe is a violent place. Stars, black holes, galaxies, all eating each other. And they punch each other, they explode, they destroy each other. My work is to reconstruct these crime scenes, analyzing the gamma rays emitted during these fists and fights. Gamma rays are the most energetic light particles, but despite that, they are absorbed by the atmosphere, and they don't reach the ground. Considering that they transformed Bruce Banner into the Hulk, it's a good thing, but concerning my job, it's a hassle. But when gamma rays are absorbed 12 kilometers above sea level, they produce a shower of other particles. And by an electromagnetic effect called the Cherenkov, a blue light cone illuminates an area of 100,000 square meters. The blue flash is short and faint, but if I can study its photons, I can reconstruct the direction and the energy of the original gamma ray and study my crime scenes. How do I study these photons? by reflecting them to a special camera that takes special pictures. Yeah, I'm a detective, but actually I'm a mirror. A new generation mirror for new generation telescopes, called Cherenkov. My telescopes don't have domes, and I work on top of volcanoes, so I have to resist a lot of element. Snow, rain, hail, birds. If I weren't waterproof, the water would fill me up. Then it would freeze, and I would distort, becoming round and fat. I'm not already round and fat. <laughs> Technically, I'm spherically curved. <laughs> anyway, I have to be fully functioning. Because only a few photons reach the ground, I capture them all, reflecting only the blue light. The red one, typically given by the light pollution, is not reflecting. <laughs> That's why I'm blue, I'm not a smurf. <laughs> How is it possible? I'm made of layers, tens of layers of different materials, called dielectrics. Altogether, these layers are a filter directly on the mirror. I know, my work is complicated, but I'm not alone. I told you, photons are spread over a large area. I need help. We are so many, my colleagues and I. We arrange huge mosaics up to 26 meters in diameter for each telescope. And soon, there will be tens and tens of Cherenkov telescopes all together on many mountains around the world. More than 10,000 blue-eyed detectives, defiant of the elements, all looking into deep space in order to solve the mysteries of the brutal universe and figure out if the battler galaxy is the criminal. Wow, we had a strip tease, balloons and mirrors, and it's only 11 o'clock. Where can we go from here? Luca, I leave you at the mercy of our judges. Hi, Luca. That was, that was fun. I enjoyed that. Um, what I can't quite do is visualize what your telescope looks like, though. I'm thinking of a telescope as a long, thin tube that, you know, you look through for pirates. Um, how did, what, what would I actually see if I came and saw one of yours? Uh, you will see some parabolic uh, thing, uh, 250 square meters for each telescope. And uh, 
there are no domes, so uh, you will see them uh, from miles. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and um, they are such very big thing, and uh, they reflect all the sunlight uh, during the day. So it's a problem because uh, they can. <laughs> it makes you a very bad neighbor, <laughs> I should imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is what you will see. And and can your telescopes pick up anything else? Um, yeah, they they can pick a lot of things, but uh, usually the other particles uh, are a noise, an inconvenience. But um, maybe I will tell you about something else uh, tomorrow. A man who. A man who leads us on <laughs> and led us on by almost taking off his shirt. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was ready for tomorrow, that. And now yeah. we've got to wait till tomorrow, where I hope we're going for the full Monty, as <laughs> say here. I can see what Viv's judging criteria. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say that there is a very important test. That's the Lubov test. If you can tell me in a way I can understand, then anyone will. So I do understand. Thank you very much. Excellent. Great. You've passed the Lubov test. Yep. <laughs> okay, that's Thank you. He's passed the Lubov test. One more time for our Fame of Italy 25 team. clear up the stage after you, Luca. We'll come back for that one as well. Fine. So thank you, Luca Perry, also an anagram of rural epic. Uh, now, next we go all the way to Australia, or more accurately, we got someone from Australia to come all the way here, and that is Sandeep Kamath. Sandeep says, my strong interest and curiosity into the intriguing world of proteins and genetics from a very early age led me to a career path in biomedical research in Australia. Wow, a strong interest in proteins and genetics from a very early age. That is some childhood. <laughs> But it worked out well, and Sandeep is now an Australian Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine Research Fellow at James Cook University in Queensland. Now, despite what some of you might remember, the Australian Tourist Commission's famous ads a few years ago with the Paul Hogan slogan, I'll slip an extra shrimp on the barbie, uh, it turns out that a growing number of Australians won't be fighting you for that shrimp. They're allergic to shellfish. That is what Sandeep's been researching, and I think what he's going to serve up now. So a big helping of Cheltenham applause, please, for Sandeep Kamath. Spotted shrimps, crab cakes, seafood marinara. Who doesn't like shellfish? And one of my favorites, Mr. Pinchy the Rock Lobster. I love eating lobsters, and I always share it with my friends. But with some of my friends, when they start tasting Mr. Pinchy here, they start getting these itchy, scratchy feelings on their skin. They get all itchy. Their trunk swells up. They have difficulty in breathing, and they might lose consciousness. And when that starts happening, they have to take out their adrenaline injector, activate it, and jab themselves in the thigh, <coughs> and leave the needle there for 10 seconds before they can pull it out. That, my friends, is the most severe form of food allergy to shellfish. But it's simple, right? If I'm allergic to Mr. Pinchy, I just don't eat him, stay away. But what if one day I'm late for work and I need to eat some instant noodles like this one here, and I fail to notice that it contains shellfish? So you see, it's not always possible to avoid shellfish, and it is really important to come up with better testing and possible treatment for shellfish allergies to avoid such an event. I am investigating the two main villains which actually cause an allergic reaction. First, it's actually Mr. Pinchy right here. And certain proteins in him, which we like to call allergens, which when we eat Mr. Pinchy, it goes through our gut and into our bloodstream. And second, with allergic people, they have these tiny microscopic bodies in their blood, which act like little Pac-Mans going blah, 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 trying to eat the Mr. Pinchy proteins. And when they do find one, it binds to it and unlocks the entire machinery of the allergic reaction. But how is this all useful? Well, it is useful for my research, which has really two simple aims. First, for allergy testing, I'm developing this device, not bigger than your mobile phones, which can take a drop of your blood so that I can detect Pac-Mans in it, and because they're excellent storytellers of the patient's allergic condition. And second, and my long-term aim, is to understand Mr. Pinchy right here and the allergens that nature has made and see how nature has made it, 
how the structure is it, what can I do to modify it or mutate it so that it doesn't go and bind to these Pac-Mans anymore, but also block it. My aim being to turn this into this, a form of an oral vaccine, which one can just eat it one day, and over a long period of time, induce a tolerance in the allergic patient. And what that means is, the next time I take my friends out to a seafood restaurant, they can eat Mr. Pinchy whenever they want it, however they want it, hopefully without having to worry about their allergies. Thank you. Yeah, you better start going up. Just make sure to keep Mr. Pinchy away from Luca's balloons as well. <laughs> Panel. So that was really interesting, and thank you for that. Uh, very, very well presented, very engaging. Uh, I was just wondering, there's, is there a big rise in allergies to seafood in the same way that we've seen rises in allergies uh, more generally? And is that about somebody's uh, genetics, or is it something else? For instance, uh, our microbiome, our guts, and that sort of thing, our bacteria. Absolutely, we have seen a very exponential rise in allergic diseases. It's not just to shellfish, but all other food allergies and aero allergies everywhere. And especially in Australia, because they have done, done some really good studies. And in the last 10 to 15 years, it, it is called the second wave of the allergy e epidemic. Because you had just seen a shoot up in rise in, in allergic diseases. And in fact, one in 10 kids have some kind of food allergies in Australia. And they are trying to look at all different theories. One is, of course, the hygiene <coughs> hypothesis. But the other one is vitamin D deficiency, and they have kind of related that to a number of increase in allergic diseases as well. And allergy is a multifactorial disease, so it's genetics, it's the environment, it's the microbiome, and it's still very difficult to pinpoint that yeah, that's the reason that it's happening, but the world is a changing place, but we are on to it. Fascinating. Um, when people get allergies, sometimes, for example, I, I work with honeybees quite frequently and, and people can get stung loads of times and then suddenly they become allergic to them. Is that the case with shellfish? You can eat it all your life and then at some point you're 68 and you sit down and have a shellfish dinner and you have an allergic reaction. It's your last dinner. It's your last dinner. <laughs> yeah. It's not a bad last <laughs> dinner either. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, uh, once I've been given fame labs, I've come across a lot of people who have that kind of condition. But mostly what the main reason is changing dietary habits. The people who have been vegetarian all their life and were trying seafood for the first time, and by the second time, they actually come up with reactions. So that is a cause of the reaction, a reason. But that is very confusing, that why some people who have been eating seafood all their life, is they're actually starting to react to it. That's something that we are still trying to find out. Are we going to have pills for every allergy in, uh, in, in some time? Sorry? I mean, have pills against any allergy in time? The way you're developing a pill for, for so say, individual yeah. foods, individual rather foods, rather or pollens, or anything. Except if you're well. allergic to pills. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, that would be that's, that's the aim. In fact, for dust allergies or aero, like once you inhale pollen allergies, they have developed some kind of treatment, immunotherapy, which can desensitize yeah. the patient. But it's a bit okay. difficult with food allergies. Uh -huh. I can say, but because okay. even the minutest uh -huh. amount can fire up the reaction, and that that's a challenge as researchers. Okay, he survived yeah. a grilling from our judges. Amazing. One more time, please, for Amazing. Sandy Kamal and Mr. Pinchy. I'm going to keep tidying up the stage bit by bit. Now, as I might have mentioned in passing, Fame Lab is now 10. And in that decade, it's gone from one country, the UK, to 27 taking part in these semi finals. That means it has grown faster than the World Cup, faster even than Eurovision. And just like Eurovision, we've discovered that once the Irish get involved, it's hard for anybody else to get a look in. <laughs> Two years ago, we had the first Fame Lab Ireland. The champion immediately went on to win Fame Lab International. Last year, the Irish winner was also excellent, but he just lost out in the final to the winner from Benelux countries, who was also from Ireland. So just like in Eurovision in 1992, 1993, and 94, this year, we've the chance to have three international Fame Lab champions in a row from Ireland. So, absolutely no pressure at all then <laughs> on 2015 Fame Lab Ireland winner Lisa Murphy. Now, Lisa's a first year PhD student in psychology at University College Cork. Uh, like many Fame, La Fame Labbers, Lisa is also a mu musician. Unlike any, she plays the spoons. 
and considers them a most underrated instrument. Now, at the Dublin final, uh, Lisa's talk was full of very specific Dublin references to things like Temple Bar and coppers and things that would have only made sense to a Dublin audience. So, this morning, is she going to squeeze in mentions of the Neptune Fountain and the Wishing Fish Clock, things that will only make sense if you're from Cheltenham? Only one way to find out. Bang your hands, spoons and other cutlery together for our FameLab Ireland winner, Lisa Murphy. We've all been there, guys. Had that moment when we're faced with 15 selfies, desperately trying to decide which one is the one, the Facebook profiler. And we may think that our decision is based on how flawless our skin looks or how luscious our lips look. But in fact, there is another critical facial feature, one that we don't even know we're looking for, symmetry. You see, as well as evolving to be a love machine and a memory card, our brain is a symmetry detector. After we've taken a selfie, like our one here, our eyes instantly scan the facial features in the photo and project this image deep into the brain's visual processing center, right here at the back of the head. Then begins a rapid and effective process of symmetry detection, whereby even the tiniest deviations from perfect facial symmetry are identified. The nose, for example, might angle slightly to the left. But the less deviations identified, the more symmetry you detect. Until suddenly, the reward centers of your brain begin to fire. You have found the selfie where your face is positioned at that perfect angle. The selfie where you have simulated perfect facial symmetry. And for a moment, you are scientifically beautiful. And we've seen it time and time again. Despite age or culture, we show a universal preference for symmetrical faces. Take, for example, the woman who has just published a book of selfies, Kim Kardashian. With superb facial symmetry, Kim is consistently rated as one of the most beautiful women in all of the world. So symmetry equals beauty. But why does symmetry even matter to us? Like, when's the last time you walked past an attractive guy or girl on the street, turned to your best friend and whispered, God, they are so symmetrical-like? <laughs> well, <laughs> symmetry matters because whether we're on Tinder or speed dating in the local pub, as human beings, our primary purpose in life is to pass on our genes. So as we're searching for that special someone on a Saturday night, we're searching for that someone who can provide the best genetic material for our future baby. But there's a problem. We can't just shimmy up next to someone on the dance floor and inspect their genetic code. So instead, as the brain evolved, it developed as a symmetry detector, allowing us to evaluate someone's genetic quality just by looking at their face. You see, by and large, the human face is designed to develop symmetrically. But as we grow in our mother's womb and throughout childhood, environmental stress, infection and disease disrupt the expression of our genes, resulting in tiny facial imperfections called asymmetries. Therefore, scientific beauty is far more than skin deep. It is an indicator of our genetic fitness and a strong, healthy immune system. And now, with the invention of the selfie, our symmetry detectors help us to flaunt our beautiful faces online, and in doing so, they help us to advertise our healthy genes. So remember, the next time you're all taking your Facebook profilers, don't say cheese, say symmetry. Hi. So, some selfie shtick with the <laughs> selfie stick from Lisa Murphy, judges. I was just wondering what you could tell us about some of the studies that have been done on animals and symmetry. Yes, um, I recently read um, one about flies, and what they did was they measured um, the, the vein measurements in the left and right, right wing of each fly, and um, these were Harshman et al. into actually this year, 2015, and um, what they found was that there was a significant association between bilateral wing symmetry and longevity, um, and this was actually predictive of the fly's lifespan. Um, also, which was um, really, really interesting to me as well, is peacocks. They, um, they found that peacocks with symmetrical tails were healthier, um, physically healthier, but they were also preferred by um, potential mates as well. So it's actually seen across species. It's so interesting. Yeah, it's a really big area, actually, in, in a lot of animal yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great to read. <laughs> uh, 
I was get, uh, and of course, women become more symmetrical at the time of ovulation, which led me when I was making a, a, a film for Tomorrow's World to meet a, a, a researcher who was measuring women's breasts and whether they oh. became more symmetrical at the time of ovulation. And I said, how do you do that? He said, I get students to come in and dip their breasts in a bowl of warm water every day. <laughs> oh. For any of those of you who thinking <laughs> of a career in science, just yes. say no Yes, yes. Who, uh, who wouldn't uh, want to dip their breasts uh, so in warm water every day? So does the, uh, does the um, s symmetry change a lot at ovulation? Uh, as far as I know, it, it does it, not a significant amount. Um, given that it's a particular time of you know, I suppose, Top attraction. reproductive viability yes. <laughs> um, um, at, at our monthly cycle, it wouldn't, it's not kind of subject to change on a monthly cycle, like a huge amount. Um, but there are definitely things that occur in our bodies as we're ovulating um, that would make us more, uh, I suppose, uh, attracted to or attractive to the opposite sex and one of those is symmetry but um, there's not a huge association but there is some. Now's the moment that's mm. what it's saying. Yes. What about, what about facial surgery if you go to mm -hmm. if you have your your face done symmetrically yeah. can you be taken to court for lying about the gene pool perhaps? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Has she made herself more symmetrical? I don't know. Yeah, well, I think yeah, I want to know. It happened in Ireland just last week. Um, no, I, to be honest, I really, I'm not sure. What is um, particularly interesting about symmetry is that there's two types of facial symmetry. One is called um, directional asymmetry, and these are natural asymmetries, and they're not due to developmental instability, or they're not due to a, a weaker immune system. Um, and our, our, our brains are programmed to, to pick this up as attractive as well. What can happen in surgery is that they can alter directional symmetries. The other one is called fluctuating asymmetries, and these are due to developmental instabilities or the individual being subjected to kind of stress or infection. Um, so while we're trying to fix those, we might actually change our, our good asymmetries. So, you know, it's a bit of a trade-off. Mm -hmm. right. Just to keep things symmetrical with the rest of yes, the people, we'll have you. to leave it there. One more time, please, for thank Lisa you. Murphy <laughs> and her table. And I should say that Lisa Murphy is an anagram of hairy lumps, but I wasn't going to mention that when she came on in case it put you off her. Right, next we have our South Korean champion, Young Ik Lee, who in his own words was a kid who wanted to be an artist. He grew up feeling the beauty of Mother Nature as he watched the moon and stars at night. As he got older, the child became curious about the harmony of the universe, and he decided to take a trip to the world of science. That child is now a 20-year-old studying theoretical high-energy physics at Pohang University of Science and Technology and sharing his curiosity with the world through FameLab. As he says somewhat poetically in his FameLab biography, don't say yes, just take my hand and dance with me. <laughs> so get ready to dance for three minutes with our FameLab 2015 South Korea winner, Young Ik Lee. <laughs> Have you ever felt that time stands still, or at least it goes really slowly? Perhaps when your dad is making you watch the fishing channel all day long? Surprisingly, modern science tells us this is not just a feeling, but it can actually be our reality. Time can pass differently between you and me. Then how can this amazing thing happen to us? The key to this question is in the theory of Einstein's theory of general relativity. General relativity deals with three main concepts, time, space, and gravity. Einstein claimed that time and space are essentially one, and that both are influenced by gravity. Well, let me explain more. Now what I'm holding is the tablet PC, and this is an external battery. Let's imagine this tablet is the space where we live, and this battery is time. People in the past, when they thought of the universe, they used to think that time and space were separate things, like this tablet, which is separately connected to the external battery. However, Einstein looked upon these two as one. A tablet that contains a built-in battery. This is what we can call the space-time universe. So from now on, we can compare the space-time to a picture on a tablet PC. People in the past were satisfied with just sliding or rotating the pitches, 
but Einstein found one more hidden function in this tablet universe, and that is, just like we can control the scale of the pictures with our hands, we can shrink or stress the scale of space-time using gravity, in this case, our fingers. When I pull my skin like this, my cheek shrinks but my chin is stressed. Like this, unified space and time affect each other. So when the scale of space becomes smaller by gravity, then the scale of time becomes relatively longer. Therefore, where gravity is different, time also passes at a different pace. Eventually, time doesn't just flow from the past to the future, but rather, like space, it is a thing that just exists in our universe. This new understanding of time has changed the way we see the world and has brought many changes from navigation to GPS. And all of this is started from a conscious awakening of one scientist who looked beyond the obvious. Questioning familiarity, that was the start of creativity. Thank you. Do you like the shoes? Um, did the, those three minutes go fast or slow? Fast. <laughs> fast, okay, yeah. judges. That was fascinating. Thank it's you. all of a sudden opened a world of fingers and, and, and the way you used your body and every part of your, yourself as prop was oh. fascinating and I really do understand relativity now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I have a question. Um, Good, because Lubov didn't. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if, if time passes differently if because of gravity, does that mean that if you're on the moon with less gravity that time yeah, goes? It could be slightly different because when gravity is different, the convecture of space-time will be changed. So we can calculate that kind of error when we use the general relativity. If you haven't seen Interstellar, it's one of the key yeah, plot yeah. points. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Interstellar is a <laughs> it's key on my point list. <laughs> of that. <laughs> about where you have time distorted, uh, for instance, people with Parkinson's have a, have a different um, view of time. For them, time goes uh, very slowly, whereas uh, time for people on drugs like amphetamines, it goes very quickly. Where does that kind of distortion of time come into things? Oh, well, that's maybe it's just related with our feelings because our nerve system, and that, that is a little different from what I'm saying because what I'm saying is the Time is really go slow, not just the feeling. So I think that kind of stuff is related about medical or other biological stuff. Or maybe in the future, we can understand what they're feeling and what they're thinking about. Then we can make special moments last longer. Or yeah, maybe we can, <laughs> we can make a travel to at the speed of light for them. Then they can make a long life because they can really times go slower. <laughs> All time flies when you're mm -hmm. having fun. Young yeah, yeah. Ick Lee. <laughs> so Young Ick Lee, he's, he's like one guy, or he's like an anagram of like one guy. But is he like one guy we're going to be seeing again in the final? Almost exactly the same question could be asked of our Portuguese semi-finalists. Well, almost exactly because we haven't seen them yet and they're not a guy. Uh, Barbara Teixeira has been dissecting animals, dead ones mostly, since she was 10, so it's probably for the best she ended up studying science, where she's now in the final year of a biology degree. Barbara used to fantasize about being the first woman to get two Nobel Prizes, so she was, in her own words, a bit sad to discover that Marie Curie had beaten her to it by 100 years. <laughs> Instead, she now dreams, slightly more realistically, of meeting David Attenborough, She's learning to speak Mandarin and to dive. I don't really see how that's going to help with that, really. <laughs> but winning Fame Lab Portugal probably has been more use because it's got her to the Cheltenham Science Festival, and you never know who could be here. Uh, so, David, are you with us? <laughs> okay, probably for the best. Might have added to the pressure over the next three minutes for our Portuguese champion, Barbara Teixeira. I remember being young and asking my mother, Mom, how are babies made? She, of course, turned a few shades lighter and started with the usual, Well, honey, when two adults love each other. But I interrupted her and said, No, Mom, I mean, how can a baby be made inside a woman? It was very intriguing to me. 
how a baby could grow in the womb. Uh, and I have to admit, even after studying developmental biology, there can still be some mysteries. Because our mothers didn't just carry us. Some amazing things had to happen so that we could be here. Uh, in fact, there is this uh, thing called microchimerism. Because since we are sharing an immune system as two different people, there has to be an exchange of cells so that um, the mother doesn't reject the baby. So these cells can be found even decades after in the mother, these fetal cells. Y chromosomes, for instance, from their sons being found in their brains. And then I've as I've said, this is called microchimerism. Micro, because it's just a few cells. And chimerism means when an organism has two or more genetically different populations of cells. So more than one DNA. And this sounds really odd, right? How can an animal have more than one DNA? But in fact, it can happen as simply as when, in those complicated times inside the room, you had a neighbor embryo. And maybe you were feeling a little lonely, so you decided to fuse together. And the result is a mixture of tissues. So this chimerism does happen in humans. Uh, usually it's found when there's a more visual characteristic, for instance, uh, different colored eyes or an even skin pigmentation. Or even if you can do this angle with one thumb, but not with the other, showing that you have different mutations on either side of the body or specific place. So maybe there's a human chimera among us and we just don't know about it. But be that as it may, and whatever relationship you had with your mother's immune system or with another embryo inside the womb, uh, we need to appreciate the fact that it's amazing that we're even here. And not, never forget to appreciate our mothers that made it possible, our own and mother nature. Thank you. All right, nice bit of candid chimera. Now let's see you do with the multiple DNA of our judges. <laughs> multiple DNA with three children. The, uh, I have three kids. Does that mean that there's multi-multiple chimerism? Yeah, you may have uh, several oh cells from them inside you right now. Oh my goodness, can you <laughs> imagine? Is it real? I mean, is, it, is that real? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. There's an exchange wow. of cells so that the, the, the immune system doesn't reject the baby. So you have cells from your mother and she has cells from you. Can I also just explain, Lubov, you're not allowed to come on here and just make things up. I know. It, it, it has to be real, it's okay? <laughs> It's a really interesting phenomenon, isn't it? And, it? and and now, as we develop the science of uh, genomics, how can, in the future, people be sure that the cells that they're taking from people are actually those of the individual and not of their, uh, their prenatal twin? That's true. In this case, uh, obviously, it's different to, see the, to detect the DNA of every cell in your body. So... That's why it's so hard to know if someone is, uh, or some animal is a chimera, because you can't know the DNA of each cell. Uh, so that's why usually there's even problems. There was this case of a woman who did a paternity test, and in fact, what it said was that she wasn't the mother. But what happened is that the uterus had a different DNA, because of what I explained, than the rest of the body. So it was very problematic legally, but she ended up proving that she was in fact a mother of ooh, her children. Ooh, it's, a, it's a new script for CSI, it's isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Get writing it. Trademarked immediately. <laughs> Got time for one more. One more. Um, yes. Every so often on the news you, you see these fantastic stories of fetus in fetu where somebody has a, has a, a twin absorbed in them in some ways or another. Um, South Park. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How big are these kind of tissue accumulations. I mean, you just talked about a uterus. Are we talking about substantial parts of someone's body or just a handful of cells? Well, it depends on the stage of the development that the fusion happens, but it can happen in embryos. So it can be somewhat developed and you just fuse with your brother <laughs> or sister and have recently it happened that someone had some uh, a bit of their brother in their brain. So <laughs> that explains <laughs> the voices. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, you were just worried about eating shellfish. Now you've got bigger things to worry about. <laughs> Thanks to Barbara Teixeira.
so we're past the halfway point, or for those who are here for the long haul, we're past the sixth of the waypoint, which is less reassuring, really, but it does mean more great fame labbers to come. Uh, next up is someone who has a strange, some might say perverse reason for entering fame lab, fear. Uh, Louisa Sopocleus was a scaredy cat with an even more scaredy dog. Uh, she describes her pet hound as being paranoid. Uh, Louise is doing a PhD in biomedical engineering at the University of Cyprus, but she realized her anxiety about presenting and stage fright were holding her back, so she entered FameLab Cyprus to try and conquer her fears and also ended up conquering all the opponents and winning. Uh, Louisa says she believes the key to science communication is lots of wine. It's an interesting hypothesis, <laughs> a bottle so you don't bottle it, and it's one I'm willing to test rigorously after these three semi-finals. So let's see what we can imbibe in the next three minutes and give a big Cheltenham cheer for the winner in Nicosia, Louisa Sophocles. In our perception, this appears blue and this appears green. But is your green same as my green? This is kind of a philosophical question we've all asked since school and it's still a pain for scientists, philosophers, even political parties. Perception aside, what if I tell you that among us, there is a rare group of superhumans who are actually able to see the world in a more colorful way. We cannot measure the experience of a color inside the brain of each of us, but what we can measure is the number of light sensing cells, the light receptors in the eye called cones. Most people are called trichromats because they have three types of those, of those cone-shaped cells, red, green, and blue, which took their name from the light they absorb. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't won my fears at the end. <laughs> so those cones took their, uh, their, their name from the light they absorb. Every time our eyes are open, those cones absorb light and send messages to the brain. The brain combines the signal to produce what we call color. Those who are colorblind have only got two types of cones. And then, and then there is this tiny group of superhumans with superhuman vision who have four types of cones and call tetrachromats. This means that they may not see through walls or turn their eyes into heat rays, but they can perceive 100 million different variants of colors, while we, normal people, can only perceive a million. Wow, seeing so many colors is probably mind-blowing. That's why men would not handle it and is restricted to women. <laughs> The reason why this, um, uh, this, um, this group of people called the trichromast are mostly women is the fact that the genes responsible for the creation of our red and green cones are found on the sex-determining chromosome X. Men have only one X, which means that if a mutation occurs in either of those genes would make them colorblind. Whereas for women who have the X factor twice, such a mutation would give them a bonus, an additional cone type. So imagine how plain and dull the song of Louis Armstrong sounds for a tetrachromatic. You know, the one goes, I see trees of green, red roses too. Red roses? Oh, come on. For them, roses are not just red. They are amaranth with flames of burgundy and red violet edges. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world, right? Thank you. Very poetic and a nice anti-male dig in there as well. <laughs> and a demonstration of the fear. So judges, yeah, you've got a lot to yeah, work yeah. with there. Uh, I think this explains why my wife always takes the mickey out of me for not being able to see colours as well as she can. <laughs> yeah. I, think she, I think she might be one of these people. I think I've, I've worked out the mystery. You thought um, this was green, so didn't you? Yeah, well, I yes. I'm a man, I don't do colours. Um, so, yes, lots of animals can see outside of our visual range. So animals can see in UV, for example, and, and many into the red spectrum. Are there any people that can... Has anyone ever been recorded that can see outside of what we would call visual light? No, to the, um, we don't see the UV because our lens uh, block the UV color. So some people, they don't have lens, so they, they might see the UV, the UV radiation. But it's mostly animals that can see the UV radiation. For example, mandy shrimp has 16 cone types. So imagine if you, uh, how, how many combinations can see with 16 cone types. Mm -hmm. 
I thought that was really fascinating. I think you did it very well. And, and don't beat yourself up <laughs> about a stumble, because it, really it really didn't matter at all, because your subject was so uh, s uh, strong. And do these people uh, realize that they have this uh, extraordinary color perception? Because how would you know that you had it, apart from your house looked rather nicer than anyone else's? Yeah, it's hard to realize. You might have some hints when you go shopping with your friends. You cannot decide what to wear or um, how do you look like. But um, you can have a, a genetic screening. So the genetic uh, screening test will, will tell you if you are a tetrachromat. However, most women don't know it, and um, they, they cannot even use it because you have to practice to use it. Um, there's a, there's a, um, an artist called Conceta Artigo, who is, uh, who she's a tetrachromat, and, uh, and she helped us understand what she's seeing because uh, it's only 2% of women can, uh, can, uh, can, under, can explain us what they see. Really that would make amazing artists. Uh, how, how recent are these studies? How, for how long have we known about this? About 20 years, but mm. only, okay. only five or ten people uh, are known that they have this uh, They're super rare, rare. This rare wow. condition. Okay, yes. go get yourself a double cone <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> Louisa Sophocles. Thank you. That would be incredible. See, now we've got four sets of cones and multiple sets of DNA. You've come here realizing you're far more complicated than you realized. So, is it an A plus for Cyprus or is Louisa a loser? We will find out soon enough. Next, our seven of nine is not a Borg or a boar, it's a Roman, the Fame Lab Azerbaijan winner, Roman Ibrahimov. Now, Roman says he's crazy about information technology and theoretical physics. His hobby is working on microchips and reading physics. His days are spent studying computer engineering at Ada University. And next month, he's due to finish his scientific paper, Time and Higher Dimensions, about a new technology he's invented. He may even finish it last month if it works. <laughs> Roman could have done with a time machine yesterday because due to visa problems, he only arrived at Cheltenham at 2 o'clock this morning and has had very little sleep. But right now, I'm afraid the only time he has to master is squeezing everything into three minutes. So brace yourself to go Baku to the future with our Azerbaijan winner, Roman Ibrahimov. Should be fairly soon, I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm almost. Almost. Yeah. Common little machine, do your stuff. Oh, there's a light gone on. Did you like put mask yourself or uh, something? Okay. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the audience has cooled down now, so I'll give you one, one more time, please, for Roman Ibrahimov. <laughs> Did you know that according to the recent studies, every seventh person consults a fortune teller at least once? Indeed, fortune telling is a business growing as fast as IT industry. However, we all might have heard stories about some mediums who make money on our insecurities. How can we survive in a world that there are so many fraudsters? Now I took this as a challenge and asked myself, while we are having smartphones, smart TVs, can we also have smart fortune tellers? In reality, we can, 
What you can see here is a revolutionary device called smart fortune teller Alex. <laughs> you see that Alex has very nice magical necklace and magical wand, and he also holds a small monitor in his hand. Well, you, you may wonder why he needs this stuff. Well, if you touch his magical necklace for five to 10 seconds, the magical wand in his hand will be shining differently. If it shines in red color when you hold it, it means that in the long pass, someone has put a spell on you. If it is yellow, it means that someone wanted to, to make a spell to you, but it was not successful. If it is blue, there is nothing to worry about. You have no enemy who wants to curse you. What an angel you are. Furthermore, Alex makes it possible to get very, very precise information about something that's expected to happen in the future. What you need to do is just to make wish and concentrate on this and, want, and push his nose for a second. After that, Alex will tell his opinion about your future success or failure on the monitor that, that he holds. Let's have a try. Now, I would really love to know whether my presentation will be liked or not. Let's check. I simply push his nose, and Alex says, of course. Now, uh, I think it's time to tell you the truth, but I'm sad to disappoint you, but Alex's old fortune telling tr tricks are nothing more than some engineering tricks. Well, in reality, his magical necklace is a, is a small temperature sensor. When you touch it or you, you hold it, depending on the surface area of your finger, it will produce different colors. As a result, on the wand, will tell you how hot your finger is. If we talk about the words that appear on the monitor that Alex holds, it is a random, random words that are printed by a small microcontroller inside of this device. As a humans, we are quick to believe in miracles. However, I think it is much safer to believe in science rather than fall prey to a fake medium. I do hope I will continue to amaze you with my new presentation, with my new device in the final. Thank you. Roman, a bit of fortune telling from me. You will travel far, have difficulties with visas, and meet three mysterious yeah. people who will ask you weird questions. Yeah. It's great to see Azerbaijan back. I'm really, really yeah. happy. I have one question. and. Why are you so passionate about talking about what is non-scientific and bringing out the science? Well, I wanted to, uh, to show the people that fortune telling, there is nothing except the science. Science is everything for us. Yeah. Do you think, uh, so lots of people get a lot of um, comfort and a lot of emotional support from things like fortune telling, regardless yeah. of whether there's any basis in it or not. Yeah. Do you think that that's an important component of it? Uh, could you please repeat the last question? Um, do you think that the emotional support that people get from yeah. beliefs, even though they may be false beliefs and ascientific beliefs, yeah. do you think that the emotional support they get from it makes them a valid part of their lives? Well, I think uh, th they should believe in that science is everything for them. There is nothing that uh, th there is nothing like miracles. You know, uh, people should accept that everything depends on science. So you're not going to be a popular boy, are you? <laughs> if you, because a lot of people who, and I'm picking up on your point here, who want to believe things because, yeah. you know, it helps them live their lives that are very difficult. Yeah. So some people are always going to have these strong beliefs, and actually, science, the fact that it, you know, science can explain something, is not going to change their belief. How do you deal with people when they have entrenched beliefs? Well, if you, if you talk about the fortune tellers, uh, when, when, when we ask them some question, they answer uh, such, a que uh, such, such an answer that it could easily be an answer to any uh, question. Therefore, I, uh, I chose some words. For example, my smart fortune teller says, of course, no, doubtful. You see that this, uh, this words can be easily answered to any question. And fortune tellers usually use this question. But what about if I want to believe that I'll open the door and George Clooney will be there one day? Uh, <laughs> well... I don't think you need a fortune teller to tell <laughs> you the answer to that. <laughs> <one thing. laughs> okay, very yeah. good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. One more time. Best there. of fortune to Roman Ibrahimov. And we'll give him another half hour to dismantle his complicated <laughs> equipment here.
I'm very cynical about horoscopes and fortune telling, but then as a Cancerian, I would say that. Uh, now, we've got two to go, and what's nearly neat is we're going to almost finish with a Finn, which is even neater if you realise there is as yet no Fame Lab Finland. And our Finn, Oskari Vinko, is the 2015 winner for Fame Lab Switzerland, a country which has a long and glorious tradition of not having champions or even many entrants who are actually Swiss. Uh, Oskari is a master's student in synthetic biology and biotechnology and says he's obsessed with DNA, how it works, on how on earth it's capable of giving rise to all the life that we see around us. Now, trying to fit even a fraction of what Oscari knows about DNA into three minutes might seem a tall order. It's only one minute per letter. But he also raises the possibility of being taller. He rates the prob probability of being taller than him at only 0.2%. <laughs> so maybe it's not such a stretch. A big hand for our big Swiss cheese, Oscari Vinko. <laughs> This pink flower is called Strega. Isn't it beautiful? You can find this very special plant in many African farms. Now, raise your hand if you would like to have this beautiful pink flower in your backyard. No, you should never do that, because that is a vampire. It is a plant-killing parasite, an invader that destroys cereals like rice and corn. Our food, that is a real serial killer. <laughs> One striga plant is capable of producing 100,000 seeds that remain active underground for 20 years. They are prowling for the prey, sniffing for plant hormones, the same way as a vampire smells blood. These plant hormones are secreted from the roots of the victim, such as corn. And when the spores detect those plant hormones, they come out of their shells and crawl towards the roots and drill holes to it with oxidizing enzymes to suck out all the nutrients, water and glucose. After one and a half months, the tree emerges the above the ground to go grow these beautiful, beautiful pink flowers. But that is the sign for the farmer that he has lost his entire harvest and he has to move elsewhere. This is happening all the time in sub-Saharan Africa, where Avia, ten times larger than Switzerland, has been ruined by Sriga. This causes economical losses of $13 billion. This amount is eight times the budget of International Red Cross or two and a half times the budget of uh, UNICEF. That plant can do devastating damage. But there is hope, because scientists have discovered a way how to get rid of Sriga. They sprinkle these very same plant hormones on the soil to trick the spores to come out of their shells to look for the host. But there's nothing. If they cannot find the host, they die in three days, and the farmers are ready to grow their seeds on a Sriga-free farm. However, producing these plant hormones has been really, really expensive until recently. The very same scientist figured out how to produce these plant hormones in bacteria, and it's super cheap. They founded a company called Asylomar Bio, and I contacted them recently to bring you the very latest news. They're pr uh, doing experiments in Kenya and Uganda right now, and the results are so promising. They have been able to destroy, uh, decrease Riga by 95% in the worst case. Many times, they got rid of it for good. Asylomar Bio is planning to launch their product next year in order to destroy the serial killer and save thousands of lives. Thank you. Oscar, I should say I've been watching Oscar for the whole of the kind of build-up period. He's been carrying this flower so carefully, <laughs> but to see him suddenly throw it to the ground, it's like I was, I was traumatized. Judges. Um, this is a sub-Saharan African problem, but is, is there a potential for this to spread into other climatic areas and cause a problem for crop growth in, in other countries? Okay, so this plant has uh, is already been present in Asia, in Australia, and in the US. In the US, for example, they made this uh, very... Uh, they, they had this campaign of destroying Sriga in the United States, and they, they managed to do it. But it's still present also in Southern America and uh, Southern Asia. And it's not only African problem, but the biggest impact is in Africa. Are there any 
unintentional consequences of taking um, a plant effectively out of the ecosystem? I mean, what eats that? So uh, I don't suppose it poses a big threat to the ecosystem but if you eradicate this on the farms. However, the treatments, when you sprinkle those plant hormones, those plant hormones uh, guide the rooting process of different plants and also fungi. So the treatment itself might have an impact, but fortunately, the half-life of the plant hormones is between eight, uh, four and nine hours, depending on the acidicity. But uh, generally, uh, this kind of invader plant that is of foreign origin in many places, so destroying it shouldn't uh, unbalance the ecosystem. Fantastic. Is there, are there other plants that are as beautiful as this and as deadly as this? Uh, so, you know the mistletoe, when, when uh, you c have to kiss when you're under that. That, yeah. al that is also a parasite mm -hmm. that lives in trees and sucks all the nutrients from those trees. So, Not it's actually plant. also a good example of dangerous but beautiful okay. thing. Okay, we're ruining shellfish dinners, Christmas, pretty much everything's gone now. Oscar Ivinko and his supporting plant. I love the fact that we're a science communication competition. We finished with fortune telling and vampire plants. So was that good enough to make the cut? Or is it finito for our fin so the Swiss miss out on the final? It is up to our judges. It's up to you and you'll get a chance to express those rights after we've had the last of our first batch of international fame lammers, and it's our South African champion, Stevie Biffin. Now, there are five benefits to Stevie Biffin, not only for Anagram fans, Stevie Biffin, five benefits, but also for the rest of us. One, she's already won fame lab back in South Africa. Two, she's now studying for a master's in neuroscience. Three, she already has honors degrees in both psychology and biological anthropology. Four, she says she's a beautifully imperfect human being who laughs weirdly and enjoys a good happy dance now and then. And five, she's about to wow us right now with three minutes of scintillating science. So prepare to benefit multiply with the beautifully imperfect Stevie Biffin. <laughs> here would like to be happier. I know I would, right? It seems obvious. We aspire to it. So you're in luck because today I'm going to share the secret of happiness. So let's think about this a little bit. What moves us to laugh, to be sad, to be angry, to be, ah! something touched my leg. I don't know what it is. Um, okay, I'm panicking. Uh, okay, can't panic. Have to think straight. Have to think straight. Okay, uh, have to see what it is. Here's hoping it does not eat humans. And... <gasps> cool, false alarm. My bad. <laughs> it's just the common house cat of the non-human eating variety. And it doesn't even have particularly large teeth. So I'm good. Okay, <laughs> so what exactly happened there? Well, in our brains we have a tiny little structure called the amygdala. The amygdala looks like an almond, and the Greek word for almond is amygdala, hence its name. Now, the amygdala is responsible for all of our instantaneous emotional responses. So if you get the giggles or a fright, this is the guy that's responsible. But the amygdala does not work on its own. You also have the frontal lobe of your brain, and the frontal lobe of the brain it's almost like a scientist gathering information from all the other areas of your brain, including the amygdala, to find out why you had this emotional response and what you should do about it. So for example, today before I came on stage, my amygdala was saying, run far, run fast, get a bicycle and cycle back to South Africa if you have to. <laughs> but my frontal lobe was like, okay, just let's take a moment here. Why are you actually so terrified? Maybe it's just because you have a really important message that you need to get across today. The message that an instantaneous negative emotion does not have to lead to a negative thought. And that does not have to result in a negative lifestyle. Thus, everyone here has the secret to happiness right within their grasp because the secret to happiness is here.
Thank you. Now put your brain down and talk to the judges. <laughs> So uh, confident talking there about our lizard brain and the way <laughs> that it uh, and, and the way that it it jumps to conclusions. Is there any way that we can override that? Because you see people, for instance, who have fear of spiders, mm. which is hardwired into us as a human species. You know, in our amygdala, how is it possible we can override the amygdala that that immediate response? Well, it's a very terrifying process, um, and it, it kind of ends up being a cool-to-be-kind um, kind of therapy, because the only way that you can override it is by using your frontal lobe and reasoning out why you shouldn't be feeling this negative terror, <laughs> pretty much, from whatever is your phobia. So, for example, there's this thing called exposure therapy, and say I have a terrible fear of spiders, right? I can't stand them, I can't even bear to look at a picture of one. What you do is you start looking at pictures with a trained psychologist so that you have a really good support uh, network with you. And then you kind of upgrade. So like you look at the spider and then you rationalize with your frontal lobe and the rest of your brain and you say, yes, okay, this time I looked at this picture and nothing bad happened to me and you grab onto that emotion, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your frontal lobe to reprogram the emotional response that you get from your amygdala so that the calmness that you're feeling in the environment at that time is rather what you associate with the spider. And it progresses if it to eventually be able to, some people are amazingly able to like hold tarantulas and very scary baboon spiders and things like that afterwards and feel completely fine. I'm wondering, um, the amygdala and parts of our memory and also um, our olfactory centre are quite closely linked, and I'm wondering whether it's possible to smell your way to happiness. Can you form an association with a, a sense of smell? Yes, smell is, <laughs> a w smell is a wonderful tool, because smell is one of, if we talk about um, what causes memories to be kind of cemented into our brain, smell is the, the key, it's the, it's the gold standard of memory cementing into your brain, let's call it that. Um, because when you walk around, say you have a smell of hmm, maybe your grandmother, a really kind, loving grandmother that always used to wear the same perfume. And whenever you walk past another woman smelling that, uh, uh, with the smell of that perfume on her, you immediately go, oh, and you get the sense of nostalgia and like wonderment. And that is because your memory of your grandmother is a pleasant memory, it's a wonderful memory. So as soon as you smell that, your amygdala says, oh yes, yes, this was wonderful, and the rest of your brain says, oh, I remember my gran, and I remember when we did this, and I remember when we, did th when we did that, and your frontal lobe goes into nostalgia mode and says, oh, I love my gran so much. I think you're relying on the international similarity of the smell of grandmothers there. I'm not sure, <laughs> that, not sure everybody immediately when you said smell of grandmother went, ah, what a lovely smell. <laughs> but, but we'll leave you with a happy memory for Stevie Biffin. Thank you. So we've had an amazing range of stuff. We've had happiness, we've had fortune telling, we've had vampire plants, space-time distortions, we've had chimeras and DNA and perceptions and conceptions and shellfish allergies and astronomical observations and facial symmetries. But this is where we reach what is known in the trade as make your mind up time. Judges, you need to choose three from nine to go through to tomorrow's finals. No ranking, no overall winner. This is not like deciding the next leader of the Labour Party or who's going to take over at FIFA <laughs> or the best route to get to Mars. We would like a speedy confab and a swift decision. Can we please send Adam, Vib and Lubov on their way with yells, cheers and last attempts to influence their decision. Now, while they um and ah and make other sort of funny noises, we need to even more rapidly reach a consensus. Now, what makes it nice and easy for us, there's no conferring, there is just voting. And the great news is they are voting pads, so it is anonymous. So it doesn't matter if you're here because your best friend was on the stage, or you're from that country, or you feel a close loyalty to them because of a long history, vote for whoever you thought was best. They will never know if you didn't <laughs> vote for your best friend. There's no reason to be loyal here. Be honest and true. Vote for whoever you thought was best. Now, being a science event, we could have made this a lot more complicated, but you'll see simply what we've done here is each finalist has a number next to them, 
very handily with nine finalists. We don't need to get into double figures or anything like that as well. So try to ignore all these factors, friendships, marriages, offers of free drinks, funny accents, uh, corrupting influences, follow your heart, or more accurately, your higher brain function. You will have about 50, so you just push the button. If you happen to push the wrong button, it's the last button push that counts, but you have about 15 seconds to vote. And if you're all clear, we will start voting now. Oh, there's a couple of people asking for the lights to be higher up so they can vote because they can't see their keypads. That could cause chaos. I'm guessing the 15 seconds. Give us a yell when the 15 seconds are up. Okay, so I hope you managed to get your vote in this time. Through the wonders of technology, we could actually tell you the results right now. Of course, we've got the high lights up now after you've voted, which is of no use whatsoever at all. But we'll, we'll improve that for the second semi-final as well. Um, if you could hand in your handsets while you leave, by the way, they're of no use whatsoever in the real world. So that would be much appreciated. Oh. That was great. If anybody was at the um, Fame Love International final last year and met David De Villa, I just never knew he could speak that slowly. He's the most wired guy. He's amazing. Now, the judges are back. They're trying to look wise and decisive, and I've been given the results of the audience vote. Come on, judges, applause, please, for Adam, Viv, Lobov. So we, had, we thought, which way do we do this? Do we do the audience vote first, and then the judges, or the judges and the audience vote? We decided to do the judges first, so that three people will be through to the final, and then everybody else will be left thinking, have I got through by the audience vote? Because basically that's more cruel, and that makes for better drama. <laughs> <laughs> I know as well. So, Adam, Lubov, Viv, have you reached a verdict on which you all agree? Yes, and we have. We have. And tell us how tough it was, especially given that you had nine minutes and 47 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the time made it a little tougher. Um, it's something of a cliche to say... Um, how difficult it is to choose a winner and a group of winners. Um, it's a cliche because it's true. And in this particular case, it was um, as true as it always is. I wanted to be immersed and engaged, and I wanted to go away and find out more. I've already got a number of topics on my kind of phone list of <laughs> things to look up, which is great. You can tell from the few sketchy notes I've made as I've gone through um, how immersed I was. And I think we all uh, agreed on that point. Presumably but number one is to tell your wife that the reason she goes yes. about colours is she's yeah, got yeah. more codes than that me. That is top unfair. of my list, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but we have, nonetheless, despite all the deliberations, come to, um, come to an agreement about our top three. Okay, then I think there's no point in being an ITV game show and drawing this out. <laughs> Let's have them whichever order. These are all okay. equal, so yep. there's, no, there's no ranking here, so say, say them in whatever order suits. We have decided, with, for no particular reason, just announce a name each. And I have to say that it's been, uh, for me, especially very, very, very difficult because I'm known for someone who's never voted any Fame Labbers ever because I all love you, definitely. And but, but, but that, is, yeah. but we that ends to here. Make we have to make the Yeah, we have to, yes. And one of the things that I'm taking away today is that my green will never be someone else's green ever. So Louisa Sophocles. Come on up. Like I say, due to the nature of time, everybody has to come up in a particular <laughs> order, but it's not ranking, no, it's no. not hierarchical. Number two, or number one, or number three, whichever you, you care to be. Three of the toughest things, I think, in science communication are to engage people in plants, agriculture, and pests, and um, we felt that one person did that particularly well, and that's Oscar Vinko. Hey. <laughs> Oh, oh, the poisonous chalice <laughs> now. <laughs> he planned that. And the reason, by the way, he can afford to do that, it's worth knowing, is when they get through to the final, they have to do an all-new presentation. So that's the downside of this. The good news for those of you fame lovers who don't win is you're off the clock. You're in Cheltenham. You're at an amazing <laughs> science festival. You don't have to do another thing. So there is a kind of good news, bad thing here. And finally, and uh, equally, obviously, <laughs> finally but equally, uh, we have Sandeep Kamath, who talked about shrimp allergy, and we chose him because I think, um, you know, allergy is a major problem. He explained it in a very compelling and confident way. Um, we especially liked his rubber shrimp, and uh, <laughs> he was one of our winners. 
Sanjeev. Where, where's, where's, Mr, where's Mr. Pinchy? You see, as soon as he's got through, he's dumped the crustacean. It's all <laughs> about him now. It's <laughs> okay, so look, congratulations. They've done brilliantly, but as you saw, everybody did brilliantly. So can we have a round of applause for them? Yeah. Round of applause for... <laughs> well, But hang on, is there a lifeline? Is there one of the six remaining who is going to be pulled through to the final by the vote of you, the audience? I've been given this envelope. I have no idea of the name that is inside it. It could be one of the three that's here, in which case nothing changes, or it could be a different name. The audience vote winner is Switzerland, Oscari Vinko. <laughs> There is absolutely no gain in being through. You don't, get two, you don't get to go twice in the final. There's no extra prize for that. But it's nice to know you've got the audience on your side as well. And so our end is also our beginning. We have our first FameLab International finalists. Best of luck to all three of them. They each, as I say, have to do a brand new presentation. So maybe they've got some frantic work to do between now and tomorrow night. <laughs> Thank you to our judges, please, again. Lubov Kostova, Viv Perry, and Adam Hart. To the British Council for supporting this, for Cheltenham Science Festival, to NASA for backing, to everyone backstage behind the event. I won't go into details because we're going to do it all again in almost exactly an hour's time at 1.30 p.m. with all new fame lambers and all new countries. Well, old countries, but new people <laughs> representing them. Thank you for coming, and I hope to see a percentage of you then. One more time, our winners. I'll, I'll tell you about that.